night has fallen when fear is coming still you're calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted you will be my strength when my mind says i'm Morning, FCC. Would you stand with us as we begin our worship? With this heart open wide from the depths, from the
take this life and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, and on my heart this much is true.
sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in We're so grateful to be here this morning and to worship you and just pray that you be with this service. Father, I pray that your spirit moves within us. Father, that you be with Ryan as he brings your word. Father, I just pray that we just rely on you. Father, that everything that we could ever want or ever need, you have already provided. You are more than enough. What an amazing friend we have in you and an amazing father. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. We are so happy to have you. I'm Amy, and here are your morning announcements. We are still in the middle of our baby bottle fundraiser. If you've not had a chance to grab them, there are still some bottles on the back table. Grab it today. All bottles are due next Sunday, June the 18th. Don't forget, Men's Bible Study is still meeting this summer, 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday night. Are you ready for some fun? Come on out this Wednesday night from 6 to 8 and enjoy the Water Games Night. It is for students in kindergarten through sixth grade. Hope to see you there. Do you want to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic? Well, if so, come next Sunday after first service to the Fellowship Hall. They will be talking about some details then. On June 23rd, we will be taking 7th through 12th grade girls to an overnighter at FCC Decatur. If you would like to join us, there is more information in the lobby. Do you know what time it is? BBS, of course. It's coming here in July. If you've not got your student registered, we are offering for pre-K through sixth grade. You can look at the QR codes around the building and sign up that way. Or if that doesn't work for you, there is paperwork in the lobby that you can sign up on. Of course, we are always looking for volunteers. The more, the merrier, as we usually have lots of kids. If you'd like to sign up to help, there's also a sign-up sheet in the lobby. We hope to see you all there this summer. The Kingdom Heirs are going on a surprise trip on June the 21st. RSVP to Evelyn Schuster if you'd like to attend. We will be having an affirmation for Jeff Denning to become an elder after both services on Sunday, June 25th. We know that was a lot of announcements this week, but as always, check your bulletin for any information you may need. Until next time, have a great Sunday. Before, uh, before we get started, I, I want to take a moment and just a couple of things. One, if you would fill out that flap and on the bottom of your bulletin, um, tear it off, place it in the offering boxes on your way out today. That's a great way for us to know you were here, but also you can communicate with us about prayer requests and other important things. We, we would love to have that. And then uh, I'll also just reiterate from there, you know, there's lots of things coming up. Uh, we have an elder affirmation in two weeks for a new elder. Um, see all of that information. You can talk to me or another elder uh, if you have any questions about that between now and then. But um, one thing I want to do before uh, we, we start is um, I, I want to pray for our CIY group. Uh, we've got, I think, 31 that are going to CIY. They leave this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Uh, they're going to Tennessee, um, and it's just a, it's, it's an incredible conference, life-changing for students, uh, changed my life. 
Um, and so uh, I, I want us to be in prayer for our students, in prayer for our, our leaders who are going on that trip, and, and just for God to move through that. So if you'd bow with me, we're going to pray for them. God, thank you so much uh, for uh, the resources and the opportunity for so many students to go to CIY this week. God, I just pray that you'd be with Sarah and the other leaders and give them um, peace, give them comfort about this trip, Father. Give them uh, wisdom when they need it, Father. Be with our drivers, and I just pray that they would be alert and, and safe. And God, we just pray that you would go before uh, these students, uh, that it would be a week that impacts your kingdom for many years. God, there's something special about getting out of our ordinary and our comfort zone and, and giving time like that to you. Something powerful can, can happen through that. And so, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be so present and moving in them uh, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We're starting a, a new series today uh, called Bottom Line bottom line, and uh, bottom line is money talk, kind of, right? I mean, you know, it, it's something we might ask when purchasing something, or, you know, what's the bottom line? But uh, all of our core verses for the next four weeks uh, in Core 52 come out of Matthew's gospel. And, and the reason we're going with this title is because Matthew was an accountant, okay? And so he, he brokered in bottom lines. Uh, it was his deal. Like, he, he dealt with bottom lines, and he, of all people, snapped to attention when, uh, when this gauntlet was thrown down by Jesus about his identity and about our election and about uh, ultimate realities and global mission and all of those things are going to be uh, talked about over the next four weeks. And so our, our core verse this week, though, in Matthew is Matthew 16, verses 24 and 25. It says, simply says, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, I said it simply says on purpose because you can memorize that verse. But it's heavy. Um, in, in 2003... Uh, there's a church of the Holy Cross in New York City that it actually got broken into twice uh, that year. Uh, in the first break-in, thieves made away with a metal money box that had been resting next to a, a votive candle rack. Um, three weeks later, though, vandals escaped with something much more valuable. They had unbolted a four-foot-long, 200-pound plastered Jesus from a meditation area, taking the statue of Christ that they left behind uh, his wooden cross on the wall behind him. And the church caretaker, uh, David St. James, confessed at his be bewilderment at this in an interview. He said, they just decided we're going to leave the cross and take Jesus? Why don't they know they, they took just him? We figure if you want the crucifix, you take the whole crucifix. In other words, St. James was saying, uh, if you want Jesus, you have to take his cross too. If you have a Bible, open it to Mark chapter 8. That's, the, that's where we're going to look at this. This scripture, these two verses come from, uh, is Jesus speaking with his disciples and his followers. It, it's quite a challenge. Uh, it, it's actually found in all four Gospels. But we're going to look at it in the book of Mark today because I like in Mark's narrative the way that this appears. This is a turning point in Mark's narrative of the gospel story. In fact, if you, wanted, if you are a Bible reader and you just want an extra challenge this week with Core 52 and it would go, I would challenge you to read the book of Mark. Read Mark and see what this 
this event in Mark 8, how it just becomes a turning point of everything that's happening and just how big a deal the cross truly is. It, it's a bit embarrassing to admit this, but I understand the choice of those thieves. If I'm honest, I understand the choice. That I understand the choice uh, uh, because I like the figure of Jesus. I like the clever and, and compassionate way that he treated people. I admire his clarity. I, am, I admire the balance of ethical teaching uh, that he gives. I, I love his stories. Uh, I, I think his character, I think the character of Christ is ideal. Uh, you know, I, the whole world, I think, would be better if more of us lived his way. According to almost every study uh, that you can find, uh, even those who hardly ever darken a door of a church, millions, millions of people are, are quite attracted to the figure of Jesus. But his cross is a little more complicated. There are times I, I just want to look at the cross and I want to take in how much Jesus suffered for me. And the cross fills me with awe, it fills me with gratitude, but I, I don't fully understand why Jesus would voluntarily choose to die to pay the price for my sins. That's overwhelming. Um, it, it's incredible to me. Uh, along with millions of Christians around the world, I've often thought, thank God that Jesus died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. And then I read this text. It's haunting for believers, actually. It doesn't get any more difficult than applying these verses. It's a text that, that at different lengths, it, 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 like I said, it's included in all four Gospels. That, that means it's important, but understanding it is one thing, applying it is a different story. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. We're going to read through verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 9. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. It's Caesarville, basically, is where he is here with his disciples. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others one of the prophets. So they're just, they're just letting him know hearsay about him. Uh, it, it, so far in his ministry, people are starting to follow him. They've heard all kinds of things about him. And, and, and so they're just repeating those things they've heard back to him. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him. Him. And Peter has like this moment. They say, actually, this is like the moment that Peter's blindness left him. Uh, that, that Peter had a moment that actually uh, Jesus even responds to him. And we'll see that here in a minute where he's just like, man, that Peter, that didn't come from you, dude. Uh, that, that was too much even for you. Uh, that, that, was, that was given to you, that answer. Look at what Peter said. Peter said, you are the Christ. We talked about this earlier in Core 52 this year, that this, this name Christ and all that it meant in the Old Testament, and it, you are the Messiah. You are the one who will save the world. You are it. You are it. It says, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. <clears throat> and he said this plainly. And Peter, <laughs> struggling after the statement he just made about Jesus being the Christ and now uh, hearing that Jesus, yep, uh, you're right, you are so right, and this is what's going to happen to me, and I'm going to, to do all this on you. Peter uh, says, actually pulls him aside. I mean, can you picture it, 
what's happening here. It's almost as if Peter has his arm around Jesus, walking him. Hey, let's go over here. Listen, that's not going to work. See, that's not what that's not what everybody is expecting of the Messiah. Peter took him aside and it actually uses strong language. It says Peter actually began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And we have an uneasy relationship with the cross. We honor the cross of Christ to be sure, but the, the fact is the cross gets in the way. We're, we honor the very thing that actually gets in our way. We, Peter reacted so strongly because if, if God's Messiah is rejected and, and he suffers, if he dies, what good is he? Right? I mean, if you put yourself in, in Peter's shoes and, and in that context, what, what good is that? How could he help? Where's the hope in that? And so the cross just seemed like it was in the way. But Jesus, he, he drops another shocker on top of that. In verse 34, he says, he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. I, I assume that these were people who were thrilled to be following Jesus. These are people, they, they were seeing jaw-dropping miracles. They were seeing demons flushed out uh, of lives like like terrified birds from hiding. They, they, they were hearing truth from Jesus so wonderful that it was like bread. For th- 4,000 men plus their families had just listened to Jesus before this for three days despite running out of food. Who wouldn't want to follow this guy? Who wouldn't want to follow Jesus? All those people, the crowd and the disciples alike, they couldn't get enough of him. And so when he began, if any of you would, would like to be my disciple, you can imagine what's happening. They're all kind of grinning and looking at each other like they're ready to raise their hands. Absolutely. That's why all of us are here. All of us want to follow you. All of us want to be your disciples. Pick me. And then the cross gets in the way. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And I suspect about that time, because we've seen this sort of, I've seen this sort of thing on Sunday morning, right? Worship's great if it doesn't get in the way. When it gets in the way, honey... I, did you know that there are churches actually that have uh, shifted their Sunday morning schedules the last several years because of football games starting at noon? Lunch and all these other things. I suspect about this time when Jesus says to them, you got all these people right on the edge of their seats. They're, they're all in. They're ready Pick me, and then he says, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. Well, then I think there were probably some men in the crowd that started whispering to their wives, you know, it's getting late, honey. It's getting late. We should probably hit the road. Our 
translations of verse 34, I think, tend to obscure the fact that the same word is used twice. So the sense here is like this. If anyone would follow after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and then follow me. That There are people who, who profess to follow Jesus who say that they believe in him, that they try to live by his teaching, who sing his praises, but they miss the cross that's in the way. Before we can follow Jesus, he makes it clear, we must deny ourselves and take up our cross. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he said it like this in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So if anyone told you that making Jesus your Savior and following him, being baptized, making him the Lord of your life and, and, and that was just easy and, and just, you, you, were, you were told wrong. Look closer at these two phrases. The first phrase, deny yourself. Deny yourself, he says. Um, He's not talking about self-denial in in the way that people talk about giving up chocolate uh, or uh, giving up a night of fun so they can study for an exam, right? It's not quite like that. This word deny is, it's only uh, used in two contexts in the Gospels. This is one of them. The other one is when Peter denied Jesus, At the end of the gospel, that's why I said if you read all of Mark, man, you can get a really interesting perspective here. But that's the other place it's used when he swore up and down to people who were sure that he was one of Jesus' disciples. I don't know this man that you're talking about. I I don't even know him. See, that's a denial. So how would it be to deny yourself then? It is as as though we look in the mirror and say, I'm not with him. Right? He is not who I follow. The reflection I'm looking at, he is is not who I believe in. He is no longer what I stand for. Denying myself is is saying to the guy in the mirror, I know know you want to be treated well. Here's where the rubber hits the road. Okay? Here's, I know you want to be treated well, but we're going to put on an apron and serve. it's looking in the mirror and saying, I know that you think we should go first, but we will actually go last. It's it's looking in the mirror and saying, I I know you think that right now we should give her a piece of my mind, but this is a time when Jesus would be silent. Because for many, that would be a daily battle. Uh, Which leads me to the next difficult phrase, take up your cross. Uh, Bishop Mule used to, years ago, he, he said people carrying crosses were people going to execution. And those who listened to Jesus that day, they knew how ghastly crucifixion was. They, there was surely an instant shock that ran through that crowd when Jesus said that, that you will take up your crosses. What they didn't yet know was how this command, take up your cross, was going to be reframed by Jesus' own death, by his own cross for for us to understand this in our context today, we have to understand what, what it is that we're really put, putting to death here. It's a, it's a sentencing and executing of our own will. Our own way. Our own importance. 
It's executing your own agenda. We, we see Jesus' disciples learning this the hard way after this. Uh, that's why I said this context of all of it. You know, we, we see them learning the hard way what it is to deny themselves and take up their cross. For example, uh, they're soon publicly embarrassed when a demon tormenting a little boy pays them no heed and Jesus groans over their anemic faith. And then, and then when Jesus catches them arguing about who's the greatest, they're, they're going back and forth about who's, who's greater, and he doesn't tell them that they're acting like children. No, in fact, he tells them that they're not acting like children. How's that? And, and then when, when Jesus tells a rich man that he has to sell everything before he can enter the kingdom of God, the disciples gasp, who can be saved then? Again and again, the people who follow Jesus see how little they know of self-denial and the crucified life. We don't really see a follower of Jesus die until early on in the morning, the day of, of Jesus' own crucifixion. See, three times in the night, Peter had denied Jesus. Three times. Uh, and the, the harsh crowing of his own denials woke him and it crucified him all at once mark as he tells in his narrative he almost whispers as you would at a funeral he broke down and wept Finally, finally, now, now, Peter, now, Peter just wants to die. Finally, in that baptism of tears, Peter grew small and broken enough to follow Jesus. A few years ago, I, I heard a, a message. I, I, it struck me, the provocative title like drew me in, but there was this message uh, that was titled Marriage, A Sneaky Way to Get a Person Crucified. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm in. Um, <laughs> and, and at first, the, the title, it, it seemed kind of crazy to me. What in the world does marriage have to do with crucifixion, Right. And you get into it, and you start thinking about it, and you realize the answer is a lot. Because um, you don't sign up for it. Nobody, nobody, nobody does this, right? Like, we, we talk about how great it is. In fact, today, like, the thing that's getting harder and harder about weddings is, like, it's not even really about the wedding. It's really more about the party. And it's just sending this message that, like, this is what it's about, and this is what we're doing. And it's like, yeah, well, <laughs> you, you don't sign up for marriage because you're thrilled about the prospect of learning to deny yourself. Or, or, or losing your old way of life. Or you don't go into it thinking, oh, good, this is going to be really, really hard. I can't wait. Thank goodness, I'll finally get to have my character defects nailed. Praise the Lord that my selfishness is about to be flogged in every way. Nobody goes into marriage or, or any other covenant in life because they're eager to take up a cross. Yeah, Jesus, and Jesus says that's exactly how to do it. That's exactly what it should be like. Who, who would voluntarily sign up? It, it, it's like this. Little Galilee, right? We've got summer camp going on, and Little Galilee just says, hey, this year the symbol for our camp is a giant mosquito. Come to Camp Stinger. Your blood is our business. Nope. <laughs> I'm out. When I, when I listen to the way of Jesus, guys, it seems that crazy. It is. 
turn the other cheek. Pray for those who persecute me. Forbid myself, for, not just from touching lustfully, but even looking at others lustfully. Visit the criminal in prison. Give my hard-earned money to a beggar. Mark got us last week with that one. No way! This is all unrealistic. This is all demanding. It's hard to walk that way in life. But here's the thing. I don't want you to be fooled. I don't want you to be fooled into thinking that it's all bad. It's crucial to remember that Christ's purpose in calling us to take up our cross is that, as he says, in these verses, we might live more fully. He calls us to die to our old selves so that his self, his heart, his soul, his mind, his strength might be more fully alive in me, in us. In Mark 8, Jesus begs his followers not to trade down in life while foolishly thinking they're trading up. Saying, don't, don't buy into this gain the whole world more for me mentality that is the rage of humanity every century. You're, you'll only forfeit your own soul. You're shot at the most real and renewing kind of life. Here's the blunt truth. If our goal is to be like Jesus, we must do what few people naturally do. do. We, we must choose the cross. The cross that's in the way. We must go the way of foolishness in the eyes of the world. We must deny the very self. We must deny the self that we're constantly being told to coddle, preserve, and expand. It's all totally worth it. And, and the only way I could think, it, and, and it's, who knows how great it is, but I was just thinking about this this week, a, a psalm. As you're reading Core 52 and all that, that Mark Moore has to say about this, and, and, and you consider all of these things in this text, there, there's a psalm, Psalm 34, that David wrote in trouble. It's been important to me. I love the psalm. I love what he talks about. It's a psalm that talks about uh, the challenge to praise and bless God at all times, no matter what we're facing, no matter what is going on. Even when it's hard, and, and, it, and it challenges me so much. I, I, I read it often, and there's this verse in the middle that you have, to, you have to understand. It has to be there to make sense of the whole psalm. It's in Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I remember, uh, man, I love coffee. <laughs> I, I love coffee, Billy. It, um, I, I started drinking coffee in college, and um, it got just, it, at first, I think it started as just like, oh, this like, I, I started learning in college I could get by with not a lot of sleep. <laughs> and because I wanted, to, I wanted to be as social as I wanted to be, and I also wanted to get all of my work done. And so I could do both and, and all these things. But then, I, you know, I just started to, to learn. Uh, and, and some people aren't going to get this, and this is going to be maybe lost on you. I hope not. But um, sometimes coffee tastes good. Took me a while to figure out, and and it, and it's because our world like messes some stuff up, and there's so many like intricacies and things. But uh, it, it takes me to like a, a coffee shop. I was sitting with uh, actually my wife's grandfather, and we, and I learned all about what how to how to make a pour over. I've got all of the things up here. It seems like a ridiculous thing. You get these special filters in this carafe. And you, you get the filter wet, and you, you put it in here. It fits when it's wet, I promise. And, and then I, I get whole bean coffee, and I grind it fresh. 
and I keep it in this so that it stays fresh when I haven't ground it yet. And, and, and so I grind exactly what I need. And Todd, you know what I'm talking about. You've had pour over with me. It's, it's different. It's just different. You, you heat the water up on the stove to a, a, the right temperature. You measure out the coffee to the right weight. You put it in here. You, you slowly pour the water. You have to grind it more. There's so many like little details, and you can't miss them. And you do it right, and, and you make it, and then you sit, and it's like, I remember when we lived in Hersher before we moved back down to Mariqua and uh, this new thing had come out and it was like this huge fad and somebody gave Becca one as a Christmas gift called the Keurig. And, we, and it was just blowing people's mind one cup at a time and you can make all these different co- and it's instant coffee. It's instant. And that's what, kind of where we live. Right? We live in this world that says we are trying our, our darndest to figure out how to have the very best in the, sli- in the smallest amount of effort in the least amount of time. So, I've, I've, man, if, there, if there's, I, I don't want to sound like I don't know, but if there's a way to make coffee, I've probably checked it out. Here's what, here's what I understand about it. When I sip that pour over, it was worth all of those steps. It's different. And you can't get it another way. And I'm telling you, Jesus is saying, I know. I, I think if he was here today, he would say, yeah, I know you live in a microwave world with instant coffee in packets. But nothing really good, nothing that tastes so good, comes that quickly and that easily. Every week we do this thing together. Um, If you got your communion elements, you can take those out. And we're going to partake together. I, I just think this is the best way to close this sermon talking about the cross, because this is what we're doing. We're, we're coming together in worship, in communion with one another to say, here's a taste, a reminder of how good Jesus is. Like I was talking about earlier, where you get to look at the cross from a, that vantage point and say, I can't even imagine that someone would do that for me. While at the same time participating in it and committing to, man, what's my cross? What part of me needs to die here? that I can continue to taste and see how good Jesus is. Father, as we partake together today, I pray that this reminder would be from two vantage points of the cross, Jesus' cross and all that it is for us. We do this, as he says, in remembrance of him. Remembering what he did for our sins. Remembering what he did for us to have a new promise of eternal life. And we're overwhelmed, Father. And as if that wasn't overwhelming enough, then we also see our cross. All this week that needed to be crucified within my life, that more of Jesus could have have been brought forth. And I participate. I participate in his death, in his resurrection. So that I can taste and see more of how good he is. He's good. First, we take the bread that represents his body broken for us. And the 
cup that represents his blood shed for us. And I'll just leave you with these words, not my own. This is Eugene Peterson translating these verses. Jesus called his disciples close and he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for for if, if any of you are embarrassed over me and the way I'm leading you when you get around your fickle and unfocused friends? Know that you'll be an even greater embarrassment to the Son of Man when he arrives in all the splendor of God, his Father, with an army of holy angels. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, You've been hearing the same old voice, the same old lie. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better lie. There's a better lie. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. He's a chain breaker. And we've all searched the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out in the same old fight. We've all run the things we know just stay. Somebody testify. You believe it. You receive it. You can feel it. Somebody testify. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers 
or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross.
worship, I just want to remind everyone that our offering boxes are up front and in the back as you leave the auditorium. And if you're watching online with us, you can give at fccmoinkwood.org or you can text give the number on the screen. Would you pray with me for our offering? Father God, we're just so thankful for the sacrifice that you made. Father, for saving us, even though we didn't deserve it. Now, Father, I just pray that you be with us as we give back to you what's rightfully yours. Father, may we just lay ourselves down. And may we put you above all things in our lives. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I lay me down, I'm not my own.